say something. 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 Number 459. The stand, please. Singing all three stanzas. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path flows from day to day. seated.
Join us once again. No, not join us once again. We have our welcome and announcements at this time. I changed the schedule and forgot about it. <laughs> well, wonderful to see you in church today. Are you glad to be here? Oh, man, beats being in the hospital. <laughs> or wherever. All right, a couple of three announcements rather quickly. Didn't make the bulletin. I didn't ask them to be put in the bulletin because I forgot to ask them to be put in the bulletin. So my announcements are... I understand last month, I, I don't really pay attention to this, I probably should, some of you do, was Pastor Appreciation Month, I don't know who originated that, but I'm, I'm delighted, and thank you. Some of you gave gifts, you sent cards, and thank you very much. I hope I've thanked you personally, but nevertheless, I also got a $100 check from the church. So, thank you, church. It's a gift card. And I appreciate it very much. Next Sunday night, immediately after the service, we will observe the Lord's Supper. There will be some distancing that I will ask you to do as you did the last time we had the Lord's Supper. You may remember it. I'll mention it next Sunday morning so that you'll know how to get all distance. And, and then uh, everybody will feel, I think, a lot more comfortable when we have served the Lord's Supper in the manner that we did prior because people like that. Now tonight... I'm not going to preach tonight. Instead, Rob Dodson's going to preach tonight. He and I had a wonderful conversation a couple of weeks ago, and he said he believes that God has called him to preach, and he wants to preach. And so I said, great. Then uh, you're on for tonight. Great. We look forward to that. Good to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming to church. Let's have a prayer. Great God, we come to thee in grateful appreciation for all of thy blessings. You tell us to give thanks in all things. You tell us it is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. And so we thank thee. For the difficult times of life, we don't feel like giving thanks. But our God, help us to do it because thou hast commanded it. And thou art our God and our Savior, and we want to follow all of your commands. You've commanded us to be here today, and that's why we're here. And we rejoice in this privilege to be with one another, encouraging one another, and then to hear the Word of God and be encouraged therein. Meet our needs. Thank you for meeting those needs. Someone listening here today or perhaps in this broadcast may need the Lord as personal Savior. May that happen today, that that person will bow the knee to the Son of God and say, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. And I confess thee as my sin forgiver and my Savior and be thankful for the everlasting life that becomes theirs. So bless thy word as it goes out wherever it is around the world. May it accomplish that for which thou hast sent it and these things I ask in thy son's name. Amen. Let's open our hymn books one more time to 401. 401, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Number 401, stand once again, please. And remain standing for the reading of God's word. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. 
And while the scriptures fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes. again, if you will, for the reading of God's word. Please open up your Bibles to Psalm 193, Psalm 193, oh, sorry, Psalm 123, my apologies, Psalm 123. Psalm 123, beginning in verse 1, and the word of God says, Unto thee I lift up mine eyes. O thou that dwellest in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, indeed, let our eyes be upon you. Let us wait upon you, for our hope is in you. Father, we are thankful for your grace and mercy that we find in your Son. And Lord, it is through him that we have the forgiveness of sins. So Lord, let us look to him for our mercy and to him for the forgiveness of sins and for him for everlasting life. Father, we pray now that the preaching of your word would reach all the hearts of your presence and perhaps those that are listening on the internet. Lord, we ask that the preaching of your word would go unhindered. Lord, let it be a great joy as we hear it upon the ears and let it take root in the heart. And Father, in all that we say and do, as we hear your word, let us desire to do it for, Father, we desire to do all those things that please you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Lord, I need you. True words were never penned. Amen. Before Sarah comes to sing for us, let's turn in our hymn books to number 512. 512. Sing the first and last stanzas of 512. Let's stand again, please. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed to his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guideth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. child and forever I am. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated, Sarah. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand my hope is Jesus the anchor of my soul the ruler of this universe the one who's in control he saved me and he will keep me till the end the rock of my salvation on christ i will depend my hope is jesus my hope is jesus when darkness hides my savior's face I rest on his unchanging grace. When faith is weak and doubt is strong, I still lift up salvation's song. My hope is Jesus, the anchor of my soul, the ruler of this year. The one who's in control. He saved me and he will keep me till the end. The rock of my salvation, on Christ I will depend. My hope is Jesus. My hope is Jesus. When he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne my hope is Jesus the anchor of my soul saved me and he will keep me till the end the rock of my salvation on christ i will depend my 
Amen. Our hope is in the Son of God. Pray for your country. And just let everyone that you can know that the hope for America is the Son of God. The hope of America is not the president, it's not the Congress, it's not any government body. It is the person of the Son of God. Matthew, please, chapter 4. Last Sunday morning, I had you depart from our journey down through the book of Mark. We were in chapter 1, and I made a detour because I'm taking us again to chapter 4 of Matthew, because Mark has not been inspired by the Spirit of God, even though he mentioned going into the wilderness to give us the details of what happened there. That's been left up to Matthew and in Luke as well. John does not mention it at all. So we are at chapter 4 because I want to digress so that we understand these temptations of our Lord. Temptation number 1. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Please keep in mind, Satan did not call him to come and meet. He issued a call to Satan. And Satan, being a created being, evil as he is, nevertheless must obey the Creator. He has no choice. He shows up. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and all of the temptations that mankind can undergo were placed upon him, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, he was in all points tempted like, it was, like as we are, yet without sin. All of that takes place in verse 2. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, now he's not asking for information. He knows exactly who the Son of God is. He is not suggesting to the Son of God that you might not be the person you think you are. So the Son of God knows exactly who he is. He is the Creator of God now in the flesh. But he's posing to them, to him rather, the concept of, you might call it, exercising independent authority. If you're God, if thou be the Son of God, you can do what you want to do. Why do you have to do what the Father in heaven wants you to do? So that's temptation number one. If thou be, in verse three, the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You have created, I think Satan would understand, certainly he's a created being. He is all-powerful, certainly Satan knows that. He knows what needs to be known about God. He knows what's in the book about God too. So he says, you may satisfy your urgent need now. Put yourself first before the Father. Satisfy your flesh here and now. Command that these stones be made bread and then you can proceed. In other words, temptation number one, exercise independent authority. There's a message there for us. When we claim Christ as our Savior, we often use the expression, and I don't see anything really wrong with the expression. Theologians want to debate about it. I don't have the need to debate about it. You receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. They say, no, no, it's backwards now. You receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. And that's the idea that most people really enjoy. And it's a good, it's a good one to think about, but never put into practice. Yes, He becomes our Savior, but even before He becomes our Savior, He is our Lord. So it is correct to say, trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you do not believe that He is Lord, why would you want to believe that he is Savior? So don't flip things like some preachers and other people try to tell you. So, command the stones be made bread. Satisfy your need. You may, in effect, as Satan is suggesting, step out of the will of God to do something that needs to be done for yourself here and now. And our Lord responds in verse 4, as I gave it to you last Sunday morning. 
But he answered and said, it is written. That's going to come up three times. It's coming up again in a few minutes. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He had priorities like every believer needs to have priorities. And his priority was to do the will of God. And it is not the will of God that he follow any of the suggestions of the tempter. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. He is permitted to do that. I emphasize that word permitted. He does not have that authority on his own. Where is he? Uh, he's about, um, I'm going to suggest probably 10 miles away. I think I'm pretty accurate there. 9 to 10 miles away in the Judean desert. It's called a wilderness in the scripture. Simply because there's very little activity there except for the beasts that live there. Most people don't live in that kind of a wilderness. I've been there several times. I know what it's like. It's uh, interesting just to see what goes on there, but there's very little to see because people are just moving back and forth. They're going from one place of activity to another place of activity, but nobody's stopping there. Nobody's living there. And he's given permission in verse 5 by the Son of God to supernaturally the two of them be transported. You say, how does this take place? I, I don't know. I don't know how the coming of the Son of God took place. How do you know how creation took place? I don't know how Jesus is going to come again. I don't know how we're going to be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how heaven is going to operate. I only know what God has revealed in the scripture and anything that I may wish to add to it in my mind is pure imagination. And I do have an imagination, and sometimes when I'm expressing it to you, I actually tell you right up front, this is how I see it, this is my guess, perhaps, this is my imagination. But they are supernaturally transported immediately. Then cometh the devil, and taketh him up into the holy city, and he sets him on a pinnacle of the temple. I've had the privilege to be on the pinnacle of the temple. You don't go there today. This was several years ago. In fact, the temple grounds, as they're called, has not really been open for the last 20 years. Too much tension there. I've been inside what is called the Mosque of Omar. I've been inside the, the, uh, the other building, the, the, the Golden Dome Temple, the Mosque of Omar. The place down under it, I've been underneath it. You say, boy, I, w I wish I could go there. I wish I could too. I've been there two or three times out of those trips. But then it stopped all of a sudden. I have walked on the pinnacle of the temple. When you're on the Mount of Olives and you see the Dome of the Rock, as it's called, you're looking to the west. You're east on the Mount of Olives. Down to the left is a wall meeting, just like this. It's a precipitous drop as it is now. But in the days of our Lord, it was probably about another 150 to 200 feet further down to the bottom. Now, anyone that would step off that temple corner, I've been there, would be a fool. You'll be dashed upon the rocks below. You will not survive. And if it was so much deeper in our Lord's day, and it was because the valley's been filled up since then. In fact, all around the temple has been filled up over the centuries. And the temple was in much more of a prominent position as it is today. But it's still one of the wonders of the world. And so he takes him there. And he says this to him in verse 6. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Jump. That's what it amounts to. Just step off the edge and jump. For it is written. You know Satan can quote scripture. Do you understand that? Yes he knows scripture. Now he'll always twist the scripture. Just like a lot of people do. They twist the Bible to say what they want it to say. Satan does the same thing. I'll read it in a little while. And you'll see the difference. If thou be the son of God. Cast thyself down. For it is written. Yes he can quote scripture. 
He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. When I get to that in the message, by the way, I'm basically just reading the scripture right now, kind of quick running commentary, if you please, to get you to visualize what's happening. He's going to misquote the scripture, and he'll add to the scripture. And that's what critics of the Bible always do. They misquote the Bible, they add to the Bible, they take away from the Bible, hmm, just like their father. Wow. Jesus said unto him in verse 7, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. First temptation, I'm giving it now three times this morning because I want you to understand it. If you'd write it down in the margin of your Bible, I think it would help you. Temptation number one, exercise independent sovereignty or authority. Take charge of your life. And that's what the world says now. Take charge of your life. You don't need a Bible. You don't need an unseen God telling you what to do with your life. You can take care of your own life. Temptation number two. Experiment with God's power. God has power, doesn't he? Has not he said, cast thyself down? Or it is written in the Bible. Uh-huh. Exercise independent authority, number one. Number two, experiment with God's power. Power. How does that work? Well, let's see what we can do with this. Satan's been defeated in the wilderness. Change of location would help. We need a different environment. And I'm imagining that he thinks, if I take him to a religious place, a sacred place, a solemn place, a place of prayer, I can meet this Jesus on his own ground. Okay. Satan is a religious person. Never forget that. He has no problem with religion. He has a religion of his own. In fact, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me just go ahead and tell you what's going to happen with the third one. Everything's going to culminate in Satan's worship of himself and he wants Jesus to worship him he says I can give you the world if you just fall down and worship me that's it that's the big time but we're not there yet because now he wants him to experiment with God's power you have power he acknowledges that God has power. Why don't you do something for yourself? So he's been defeated, Satan has, in the wilderness, and he's glad to move on to a sophisticated religious and political capital called Jerusalem and the heart of Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish world, is the Temple Mount. So he takes him there. Does Satan respect that which is sacred? No. Does he respect that which is religious? Yeah. The language is not sacred to the world. Our language is not sacred to them. They degrade us once in a while with biblical phrases because we say, I've been saved. Saved? What is that? Is that some Baptist thing? No, it's a Bible thing. Oh, you have a new birth? Well, I had a new birth too. I quit smoking. That was my new birth. I joined the church. That was my new birth. I, I even got baptized, of all things. Well, what a new birth experience. That's the way the world looks at things. And when, when men and women need a name in which to forcibly express themselves, guess whose name it is? Christ. Jesus, oh my, I don't want to say it, but you know what the next three letter name is, don't you? Oh my, and that's how they express themselves. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if this is appropriate, but I want to say it anyway. I don't think they would do that with the name of Muhammad or Allah because there are people in prison right now in certain parts of this world because they have drawn a cartoon, as in France, of the prophet Muhammad. Oh, my. You get put in jail for that. You can get one of those doing that. And they're quick to do it. So when people need to express themselves without good intelligence, and they have to have profane words and names, where do they go? They go to the Bible. Satan does not respect that which is sacred. And he isn't respecting the Son of God in these temptations either because he is the sacred Son of God. So now the appeal. Here it is, Psalm 91. I'll give you the reference. You want to write it in the margin of your Bible. It's Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Now I'm going to read it carefully, slowly, and then you see how Satan puts it in verse 6. Here as it is from the book of Psalms. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. He omits to keep thee in all thy ways in verse 6. Well, what's the big deal? Uh, the Word of God is a big deal. The Word of God is the Word of God. Don't mess with it. Don't change it. Don't say, well, it needs my few words to make it sense. It needs my commentary on it. Don't do that. If you want to give your commentary on the Bible, then tell people that's what you're doing. Don't change the word. Don't mess with the scripture. And he misapplies it by lest at any time he adds that that's not in the passage I read to you. Every false teacher takes the scripture out of context. I've already told you. Now what's his aim? Aim is to prove God's power. Prove it. Isn't that what the world always wants you to do? Well, if God's a God of miracles, <coughs> let's see one. Show us one. We'll believe you. Mm -hmm. Pardon the expression. It's a worldly expression, but everybody understands it. Lots of luck. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll believe in God. Can you, can you produce a miracle? In other words, two or three things are involved here. Here we go. Do the unnecessary to prove your faith. Jesus, you need to prove who you are. If you will stand on the pinnacle of the temple, now I'm kind of filling in what's going on here. You understand? This is my imagination. He is there. He's standing at the pinnacle, the corner of the temple, the deepest part of the temple where it falls down into the valley. And he's saying, prove your faith. I imagine something like this might go on in Satan's mind. If you will make an appearance there, people are coming and going in the temple. They're all around it. They're all around the base of the temple. They're in it on a daily basis. It is the focal gathering place of Judaism. It is the focal plane, uh, to, uh, place of all Judaism and Jews in particular. That one place. Gather there. Spread your arms out. Speak to the people. Everyone, I am here. I am your Messiah. Well, you, you'll have a crowd in just a few minutes. And they'll see you. Cast thyself down. He said he would take care of you if you did. Go ahead. Then when you hit the bottom and you stand up, you say, I don't see any of that. I know, I told you it was what? Imagination. This is the concept. This is the idea that's being planted. And then when you stand erect at the bottom, everybody will cheer. There he is. He is the Messiah. Do the unnecessary to prove your faith. 
I haven't seen the bumper sticker in years. It used to kind of tickle me when I saw it. I never responded to your bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus. I never responded. So why didn't you respond? I didn't consider it appropriate to respond. Secondly, I didn't want somebody rolling down their window and yelling at me. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, you got a bumper sticker there I'm behind you. Or giving you an obscene gesture. I don't need any of that. I don't honk if I love Jesus. Now, you can honk if you love Donald Trump when you go to the corners because that's going on in the county, probably over the country. If you want to do that and say, hey, I'm with you, honk, honk, honk. I don't care what you do. But then I remember, it was years ago now, then I remember seeing a counter bumper sticker. Now, you had to get a little bit closer. But there was a counter bumper sticker about this long on the back of somebody's bumper said something like this. Tithe if you love Jesus, anybody can honk. <laughs> oh, by the way, let, let me digress, please. You don't ever, you don't tithe. You say, you're telling me why I don't do it. No, 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 listen to me. You don't tithe. You return the tithe. The tithe is not yours. It's not yours. The Bible says it belongs to God. The tithe is the Lord's. So there you go. So you, you, you return to God what's already his. So tithe if you love Jesus, anybody can honk. And I've never known anybody to honk. But anyway. Number two. Number one, do the unnecessary to prove your faith. Number two, do the unusual to popularize your faith. Yeah, do something unusual. Now, standing on the temple, calling attention to yourself, maybe even having the priest in the temple who had these big long horns and they would blow the horns at certain times of the day to signify certain things are happening in the temple. Uh, get them to start blowing. Everybody's attention all over Jerusalem now is going to be directed toward the temple. Well, you'll have more crowds than you ever imagined when you stand on the pinnacle of the temple and then just open your arms and step off and fly on down. Cast yourself down. Nothing's going to happen bad. Uh, do the unusual to popularize your faith. The world loves the spectacular. Hmm. Many years ago, I'll not give you the name. It's in the Orlando area. There was a pastor. I knew him. We were not close, but I knew him. I won't even tell you what side of town the church was located on. But it was on a little bit of a rise on a main thoroughfare in Orlando. And every Good Friday for years, he had three of his deacons hanging on crosses. Yeah, huh? Huh? Yeah. He had three big crosses set up on the lawn right, right beside the roadway. And he had three deacons. Now, they had a little pedestal on which they were standing. You understand they were not nailed to a cross. You, you do, you're with me, aren't you? Okay, I just don't want anybody to go wild with their imagination. And uh, they would stand there, and they're, they're lashed to the cross. So they're standing. I mean, you talk about drawing a crowd. He, he would draw a crowd. Everybody that went by, it would be on TV. Everybody that went by, go by real slow. Like, huh? Three men hanging on crosses. I got a brochure one time. I can't think how long ago it was. But it was from an organization of parachutists. Now, Brother Ed Fallon gets all excited about parachutes. I mean, he lives and breathes parachutes. That's his life. Loves parachutes. Ed, have you ever jumped? Yes. Have you? Love Wonderful. I'm glad you did it. Because I don't want to do it. But I'm glad you did it. And I'm glad it was a tremendous experience for you. Was it one of your parachutes? Oh, no. Oh, it was. Uh, you didn't pack it, did you? <laughs> Never pack your own parachute, I've been told. But nevertheless, I got this brochure, nice colored brochure, wanting to come to the church. These men wanted to come to the church, and they wanted to, to parachute. Uh, we'd, we'd get a crowd. That was the whole idea. Advertise this. Here are advertising things you can send to the newspapers and on TV, and you can advertise. Now, their ministry was, we jump for Jesus. That's what it's called. We jump for Jesus. 
and you're supposed on Sunday morning to get the biggest crowd you'd ever have all over your parking lot. And then they're going to fly over, and there are three of them, they're, they're going to jump out of the airplane, and everybody, and I've seen them do this, especially in Titusville, it's kind of interesting, and they jump out of the airplane, and they all parachute, and they're going to land on the parking lot or out there in the field, and uh, I would have a microphone set up for them if I were to go along with this. I would have a microphone set up for them with a couple of speakers out there so that all the crowds, the crowds, the crowds of people are going to be there to see the jump for Jesus. They're jumping out of the airplane, going to parachute down, and as soon as they land, they unloosen all the, the belts and buckles and so forth, and they step out, and now they're going to preach the gospel. Could they preach the gospel? I, I would hope so. Would they get a crowd? I would think they'd get a big crowd. Would it cost the church a lot of money? Yeah. But I couldn't make a decision on any of those things. Is this honoring Christ? Is this something spectacular? Are we trying to popularize our faith by doing something that nobody else is doing in a church, as far as I knew, not around here? Would it have accomplished the end that I wanted, and that is to get our church on television, perhaps, or, or get our church noticed? Uh, that wasn't what I wanted. Not that way. You want to popularize this church? Let me tell you how to do it. Go to your friends and your coworkers and invite them to come to church with you. And then tell them, tell them what to expect and say, I want you to come to church with me. The aim is, <clears throat> the aim is, Experiment with God's power. Do the unusual to popularize your faith. Do the unnecessary to prove your faith. Number three, do the unwise to prioritize your faith. Show your faith. Do something extreme. You know, what, what do you mean, preacher? Uh, all right, quit your job. Well, that would be extreme. Uh, okay, you want to you want to uh, prioritize your faith. You you want to have your coworkers see what great faith you have in God. That you believe that God, if you just pray, God's going to supply your need. Uh, quit your job. And then tell them before you walk away from your job. Now, I just want you to know that I serve a powerful job who can supply all of my needs. He can do anything, and, uh, and I'm quitting my job because I want to be a good testimony to you men and women that work here to show you what God can do with somebody that is committed to him. This is going to be my testimony. Go ahead. You say, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I don't advise you to do something that silly, that stupid. W would you get attention? Oh, yeah, you'll get attention. Mm -hmm. I had a preacher friend one time. I can't give you any information about him because it would be embarrassing. He was a fellow who said God had called him to preach. He uh, had at least two children. My wife knows who I'm talking about. I know he had at least two children. They had more, I can't remember. And he came to me. He lived in this area. And he came to me and he said, would you support me to start a church? I said, well, I'll think about it. Okay. So I said, what are you doing to take care of your family? Now listen. God calls some men to be bivocational. In other words, they're going to work. We had a fellow saved in our church a long time ago, Jim Searcy. I wish I had time to tell you all about Jim. Good testimony. Jim was probably 45, 50 years old when he retired from the military, and he wasn't saved. Then he got saved. I had the privilege to lead Jim to the Lord. And uh, then Jim, he believed God wanted him to to minister to small churches. So he went to Bible college. Had a wife, had two or three children, didn't he, sweetheart? Three, I think. Went to Bible school, and he's 45, 50 years old. And when he graduated, he said, I want to devote my life to little churches here and there. 
that cannot afford to pay a pastor. And that's what he did with his life until age 59 when God called him home. Now, Jim had a retirement income. He was a, a, he was a master sergeant in the Air Force. So he had some income. He had some benefits. And he said, whatever the little church is, I'll go from this church to that church, next Sunday another church. He, he had a circuit working here in the state of Florida. He said, I, I, don't, I don't need the income. I can handle my own resources. And he devoted his life to doing that. Sometime there'd be a dozen people in church. And he gave his life for several years to their ministry. And then went to be with the Lord. But this preacher wanted our church to support him. And I said, how are you taking care of your family? Well, I put my wife to work, he said. Well, okay. He put his wife to work. I said, what are you doing? He said, I don't work. I said, why don't you work? Well, he had been trained by some pastor somewhere out west. And he said, I got saved out there and got trained under my pastor. And he said, my pastor said, uh, they that uh, work, work for the gospel, they live with the gospel and so forth. Uh, I understand all that. I understand. He said, so I don't work. I said, in other words, you're dependent solely upon your wife. You've got two or three kids, and you put your wife to work. I said, what do you do with your time? He said, I fish. I said, commercially? Oh, no, oh, no. I just, I love to fish. And every day, every day, I found him right up there on the old galley causeway every day. In the morning, he's fishing. In the afternoon, he's fishing. He's sitting in a chair on the causeway. Why? He'd been convinced. Preachers don't work. Well, I can tell you this preacher worked in order for this church to get where it is. And I, I'm not bragging. And I would do it again at the drop of a hat if that's what God wanted me to do. I'd do it just like, there we go. I can't always snap my finger like I want to. Just like that. And my wife helped. And I didn't put my wife to work. She wanted to help. Because when this church started, there's nothing. There is nothing. You start with nothing. I was 10 years the pastor of this church before I had the same income I once had as an assistant to a pastor. I'm not complaining, not one bit. But I became upset with this guy. I said, you need to get a job. Now, if your wife wants to work and help you and help the family, that's all right. But I said, you are going to go to work. No, I'm not going to go to work. I said, you'll never get a dollar from our church. I won't help you one dollar because you're not going to do anything to support your family. Well, God's called me to preach. I'm going to sit on the riverbank out there and fish all day long because uh, I'm not supposed to work. I said, you need to work. Oh, by the way, nothing ever worked out. Never started a church. Tried. Couldn't get more than six people at one time. And they were people that were disgruntled from other churches. And it all just... Folded right in on top of them. Uh, they moved out of the area. I, I've not heard from them. And uh, wouldn't really care to hear from them anyway. Do the unwise to prioritize, prioritize your faith. Listen, God never uses the supernatural when the natural will do. You're going to sit on the bank and you're going to fish all day and expect God to somehow rain down dollars and resources and put it into your hands. God will... Never do the supernatural when the natural will do it. If a man should not work, he should not eat. I told him that. I said, you don't work. If you don't eat, I don't care. Well, you care about my family. I said, okay, we'll put some clothes on the kids. So that'll help you. But I said, I'm not going to give you one dollar. And he never got a job as far as I know. So I don't know whatever happened to the fellow. Now, here's the answer of Christ. Here is his answer. Verse 7. It is written... Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If you want to put in the margin of your Bible, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Deuteronomy 6, 16. He refused the acceptance, the approval, and the applause of the world. God doesn't need it. He desires it. He doesn't need it. 
He is still God. The first attempt is physical. Command these stones to be made bread. The second is psychological. Present yourself. Do something spectacular. And you'll have a following. Sensationalism always appeals to the flesh. Miracles never produce faith. May I say that again? Miracles never produce faith. They may strengthen your faith, but they're not going to produce faith in other people. Listen to this. Here's the 27th chapter of Matthew. You'll get the picture. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let him, let him be the king of Israel. And if he is, let him come down now from the cross. And we will believe him. He's hanging on the cross for sinners. And the religious people say that to him. Now, if he can bring himself down from that cross, yeah, okay, we're waiting, we'll believe. He would never have done that. If he should or did it, if he should do it, you think they're going to believe? No, no. Listen, unsaved people always have another miracle. Uh, we need another miracle. We need... Uh, Another miracle. That's, that's what unbelief wants. One miracle after the other, and then they deny every one of them. Jesus refused for two reasons. Number one, people are never satisfied. I just told you that. They're never satisfied. They demand more and greater because they want the sensationalism. You know why they hung around him after the feeding of the 5,000, which was probably the feeding of around 25,000, all told. You know why they're around him the next day? They're looking for another meal, another handout. Oh, they fell in love with him. He's the Messiah. Uh, a few may have. The great majority may have fallen in love with him. They're just looking for whatever he could do for them the next day. So they're looking for him. He's gone on. Number two. To test God is to doubt God. Hear me? To test God is to doubt God. Doubt is not trust. If you trust God, you're going to trust God. You don't know how things may work out, but you're going to trust God. To test God is to doubt God. Not to trust God. Not to trust God is sin. And so, Jesus says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Trust in God's promises. He never fails. We'll stand for prayer, please. You'll stand with me quickly and quietly for prayer. It's about may those who are watching over the internet, if they are in a position to do so, bow and ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness of the, especially the sin of unbelief. John chapter 3 says <coughs> that that is the condemning sin. That is what condemns a man. It's not individual sins per se just that one in particular they do not believe upon the name of the only begotten son of God and they're condemned ask God for forgiveness of the sin of unbelief and say I'm not going to doubt God any longer I'll not ask God any longer to prove himself to me I will I'll trust his son as my savior. I'll trust him alone. I'll bring no baggage. I'll just trust in him. Maybe someone's here in this audience that needs to do that. You've trusted everything else. You've trusted everyone else, it seems. And you have no peace. 
Well, outside of Jesus Christ and a life that is turned over to him, Lord and Savior, there is no peace. There won't be any. Oh, you might be able to shed something here and there and change a little bit here or there, but you'll never have any peace. And when you go into eternity, there's never another opportunity. It's now. Who knows? Maybe it's now or never for you. Come to Christ today. Heads are bowed. Will you come to Christ quickly? Quickly now. Come at the front. Let me introduce you to a soul winner. Someone that will open the Bible and show you how to be saved. Darlene, will you help me please? Darlene, thank you. Heads are bowed. Darlene's going to help someone that needs to put trust in Christ. Heads are bowed. How about you? Are you sure that you've trusted Christ? Or have you added him to your religious philosophy? You've tried to bring him into your life. And he desires control of your life. Yes, harsh word, but true word, to control your life. He cannot do wrong. He can't make mistakes. He does all things well. Why can't we trust him with our lives? Give your life to Christ. Just as I am in waiting not, to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee, whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. You come to Christ. Make him the center of your life. Trust him as Lord and Savior. Heads are bowed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for thy word. What a joy, just an exciting time of life to, to stand or even sit before people and open the scriptures and share with them the, the wondrous things out of thy word. And these people have given me that opportunity again. Lord, thank you for bringing them here. Maybe someone's being brought to Christ as a result. And even if not, then we faithfully attended and we've heard the word and perhaps we've been blessed by it and that's your will. Bless the word of God as we hear it tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.